The earth is empty of life, it's unfit for life, and now God miraculously intervenes, and what's the first thing he does with the earth? He says, let there be light. Now notice the text doesn't say that God created the light. It doesn't say that God made the light. It says, let the light be. This is the first time that light appears on the surface of the waters of planet Earth. Before day one, it was dark. Why was it dark? Because the clouds of the primordial Earth were opaque to light. What God did on day one is he transformed the atmosphere of the Earth from an opaque condition to a translucent condition. So the light could come through and photosynthesis could begin. For advanced light to be possible, the Earth must be oxygenated. It's crucial that we have photosynthetic life happening aggressively and early. Indeed, what I talked about uh, earlier on the origin of life, we have isotope signatures that tell us that photosynthetic life was right there at the very beginning of life here on planet Earth. Because God was wanting to bring about advanced life as quickly as possible, uh, given the laws of physics that he set up. Now, the fact that the text says, let there be light, implies that God transformed the atmosphere. Job 38 and 39, as I mentioned, also give you an account of the six creation days. And Job says this explicitly in verse 9. I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. So whereas Genesis 1 implies that it's dark because of the clouds, notice that Job 38 is explicit that the reason for the darkness is because of the clouds. And so creation day 1, God transforms the atmosphere. So that the light that's outside the clouds can now penetrate to the surface of the earth and make life possible. <laughs> now, how would God do this? When I read it at age 17, I had no idea. Today, we know how God transformed the atmosphere uh, from opaque to translucent. And uh, if you picked up this uh, DVD, Journey Toward Creation, we actually have a video clip there uh, which shows you how scientists determine how this transformation took place. I'll be very brief. The details are in the DVD. Namely, that when God made the Earth, there was another planet that shared its orbit. And uh, that's something that we see in the uh, you know, celestial mechanics. That if you've got an orbit of one planet above a star, you can go back 60 degrees or forward 60 degrees along that orbit, and you get what are called Lagrange points, where a second planet can share that orbit, and it's a stable orbital pattern. Two planets can share the same orbit if they're exactly 60 degrees apart. Now, it's stable if it's a three-body situation, where you've got a single star, two planets, in the same orbit. It's not stable if you've got other planets. And so because of Jupiter and Saturn, the smaller the two planets got pushed out of its Lagrange point and began to creep very slowly along the orbit and eventually collided with the Earth. But collided with the Earth at a high attack angle at a very low velocity into an extremely deep ocean. The primordial Earth had an ocean about 500 times as extensive as it is today. And so this body collided in this deep ocean, vaporized all the water, and blew off the atmosphere of planet Earth, and a much thinner atmosphere replaced it. Now Venus is referred to as our sister planet. Its atmosphere is 40 times thicker than our atmosphere. And because we're farther from the sun and more massive than Venus, Earth's primordial atmosphere would have been 100 times thicker than we have today. But it was this collision event that eliminated that thick atmosphere and allowed a much thinner one to replace it. <clears throat> it's also that collision event that brought about the existence of the moon. Earth started off with no moon, but it was thanks to that collision event that the moon formed of sizable nature and stabilized the tilt of our rotation axis. It's also that collision event that salted the Earth with a lot of heavy metals. Because what happened is all the heavy stuff in the colliding planet got absorbed into the Earth, and all the light stuff on the Earth and in the planet got blasted to outer space and formed the Moon. That explains why the Moon is made of lighter composition than the Earth. 
because they didn't form together. The moon formed as a result of that collision event. So this explains not only how the Earth's atmosphere formed, it also explains our water cycle. Because in order to have a water cycle on such a massive planet as the Earth, its atmosphere must be very thin. By the way, we're now finding what we call Goldilocks planets outside of our solar system. Planets of the same size of the Earth and the same distance from their star. And what we're discovering is they have anywhere from 200 to 1,000 times as much water as our planet. So water rich that they can never form continents. As thanks to this event, that we have a planet that has both water and continents on its surface. It's also thanks to that event, we have a planet where we have a water cycle where there's snow, ice, frozen water, liquid water, and water vapor all being cycled efficiently in this water cycle. Not necessary for life in the ocean, but crucial for what God will do next, the formation of the land masses. Now the land masses are able to form because of two reasons. God removed 99% of the water, more than that actually. And we have a thin atmosphere that replaces it. That collision event also salted the earth with a lot of uranium and thorium. And so radioactive decay of uranium and thorium that provides the energy that sets up the plate tectonics that leads to the formation of continents. Now, today we understand plate tectonic activity in sufficient detail that we can reconstruct the growth of the continental land masses on planet Earth. And it's such that we can confirm that indeed the Earth started off as a water world, then a few tiny volcanic islands formed, and then plate tectonics kicked in where it began to form continents, and we have a very aggressive period of continental land formation when the Earth is about two billion years old, then it slows down, and the continents are continuing to grow to this day but right now they cover 29% of the surface of the Earth, which is what you need for a global human civilization. Uh, global civilization is not possible when it's 28%, it's not possible when it's 30%, you need it right at 29%. That's where we are today. In fact, there's a book out that talks about how in the future, the continents will be too big for global human civilization. But right now, everything is ideal. But something else I want you to notice, the Bible tells us that God forms these continents predominantly towards the end of creation, at the beginning of creation, day three. Okay, you've got six days of creation. The biblical text says that the, you know, towards the beginning of creation, day three. Now, as you look at this uh, chart here, or this graph, what you notice is that the scientists, the geophysicists, have established that the most aggressive period of continental uh, growth took place when the Earth was a little bit more than half of its uh, current age. Notice that the two agree. The timing that geophysicists have established for the growth of the continental land masses is identical to what we see claimed in the six days of creation. Then we move into the second half of creation, day three. And what does the text say? Let the land produce plants. Now there's been some debate about what the Hebrew means by produce. Well, again, it's a small vocabulary language and it, there's three possible interpretations. God supernaturally produced all the plant species on the continent of the land masses. God did it through natural process, or God did it in a combination of natural process and supernatural intervention. There are articles on the website that establish this predominantly supernatural intervention. But then there's some debate as to exactly what kind of plants the text is talking about. Well, it begins by saying that God created vegetation. And the Hebrew word that's used there for vegetation is deshep. And it means green plant life. So any, plant, any plants that uh, is using photosynthesis is included in this word. So it's a highly generic <coughs> term in the Hebrew. Literally refers to any life form uh, that's engaging in photosynthesis. And then following the, the description of how the continents will now have this to shed, it gives three examples. Now it's important to recognize that it's three examples. It's not intended to be a complete list. 
So the general claim is that God creates this vegetation on the kind of the land masses, and it gives us three examples, namely the seeds, the trees, and the fruit. Now it's important is that many English language readers of the text here thinking that the text is simply referring to God creating advanced flowering trees. Well, that's part of it, but it's not all of it. And it's simply examples of what God has done. Moreover, when you look at the Hebrew words for seed, trees, and fruit, they're far more generic than they are in English. So the word for seed means the embryo of organisms. Well, it applies to all life on planet Earth. Uh, the word for tree, ex, refers to any large plant containing stiff fibers. That certainly includes trees, but it would also include celery. It also includes even algae that form long strands, would be included in this term. And the word for fruit is the word peri, which means food made by organisms. And notice that every seed has accompanying food to sustain the seed. So we're really talking uh, not the most advanced plant forms on planet Earth, uh, but rather the more primitive ones that first showed up in the cult of the land masses. Now I mentioned that I've done a few debates with Michael Shermer of the Skeptic Society, and in a couple of those debates, he ridiculed Genesis 1 for claiming that plants preceded the animals in the cult of the land masses. He says, hey, if you look at the biblical text, it talks about God creating animals in the oceans, and then we had the plants before that, and we know the fossil record has it the other way around. Well, my response back to Michael was, it's much easier to find fossils of animals than it is to find fossils of plants. And it's true. When you look at the Cambrian explosion, the fossils we see are animal fossils. Now, does that mean there are no plants in the ocean? Well, animals have to eat something. If there are no plants, there's no possibility for animals being alive. And in my explanation for why we only see the animal fossils, they're the ones that are easily preserved, and the plants simply decay away. Now that explains the lack of uh, plant fossils we see in the oceans at the time of the Cambrian explosion. What about the continents? Well, once again, it's very difficult to have the plant tissue preserved. But we have recently, this happened literally just weeks after my last debate with Michael Shermer. Two papers got published in the British Journal Nature. The first was published in late 2009 by Moth and Kennedy, where they made the point, yes, we have no fossil evidence of the first continental land uh, plant life, but he said we have isotope evidence. And so they published a paper making the point that Plants were just as abundant on the continental land masses for 200 million years previous to the Cambrian explosion as they were for the 200 million years after the Cambrian explosion. So the isotopes prove it, even though we don't have the fossils. But then later, a team led by Strother said, now we found the fossils. It's not that they found complete fossils of plant uh, uh, organisms. They found pieces. Because the preservation is so challenging, uh, all we can really find are the broken up pieces of these uh, plant fossils. And typically they're only like about a millimeter in diameter. Uh, but after diligent search, his team found them. Moreover, they were able to publish that plant life was as abundant on the continental land masses as far back as 1.2 billion years, 600 billion years before the camera explosion. So thanks to these papers, Genesis 1 has been fully vindicated in its claim that the plants proliferated on the continent on the continent of land masses before the Cambrian explosion event that's described on creation day 5. Genesis 1 got the order right, but for years skeptics have been claiming it got it wrong. Moving into creation day 4 is when the atmosphere is transformed from translucent to transparent. So for the first three days, it's overcast. I think those of you living here in Vancouver can understand that it can be overcast for a long period of time. We're referring back to the age of Earth's history where it was overcast all the time. What happened on day four is the clouds broke, and now for the first time, organisms on the surface of the Earth could actually see the objects that are responsible for the light. This is when the sun, moon, and stars for the first time became visible. 
It also explains why the text in verse 14 says, let there be the great lights. Again, it doesn't use the word create. It doesn't use the word make. It says, let them be. This is the first time they become visible. Now, for whose benefit? Well, what you see described on creation days five and six are the advanced animals. These are animals with complex biological clocks that must be regulated. And we realize about birds and mammals, and even about the Cambrian mollusks, for example, is that they're sufficiently complex that they need to know where the position of the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky in order to reproduce at the right time of the year, migrate at the right time of the year, hibernate at the right time of the year, uh, etc. We also know how this transformation occurred. It occurred through billions of years of photosynthetic life activity on planet Earth. You can say, why would it take so long? Because the Earth is filled with oxygen sinks. So you have to oxygenate the mantle of the Earth, the crust of the Earth, before the atmosphere becomes sufficiently oxygenated. And this is exactly what the atmospheric oxygen history of the Earth looks like. It explains why not until creation day five do we have God creating large body animals. There's simply not enough oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere for that to happen. The other thing we notice is the very moment oxygen reaches a level that makes possible animals that are a few centimeters in body size immediately you see those creatures. There's no time delay between the minimum oxygen necessary to sustain those animals and God creating those animals. Now, it does say in verse 16, so God made the sun, moon, and stars. But the difference between Hebrew and English in this case is that in Hebrew there are no verb tenses. You know, the English language is fundamentally founded on verb tenses, so we know exactly what the timing is. That's not the same in Hebrew. In Hebrew, you've got three verb forms. One for commands, like do this, do that. Another one for action that's not yet finished. And then a third one for action that was completed at some time in the past. In verse 16, you're getting a parenthetical note. Verse 14, let there be the great light so they may serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years for the benefit of all the life that God creates on day five and day six. All the life before day four doesn't need to know where the sun, moon, and stars are. All the life after day four critically depends upon that. Then verse 16 is a parenthetical note. So God made the sun, moon, and stars. And it's in the completed form which tells us that those sun, moon, and stars were made by God before day four. Not on day four, but previous to day four. And based on what we understand from the text, they must have been made before the six creation days. Well, let's move into the more exciting stuff, creation day five, where it says, let the seas swarm with these small sea animals. And this is a reference that we now know as the Cambrian explosion where 543 million years ago, most of the phyla that have ever existed on the face of the earth suddenly show up all at once. And there's two places in the world where you can document that. Uh, one is in Yoho National Park, right here in British Columbia, and others, another site is in the desert in China. Uh, frankly, it's much prettier to go to one in Yoho Park. Uh, but both sites document the Cambrian explosion fossils. As you go to these uh, fossil sites, it immediately becomes clear that we're not seeing an evolutionary tree where different species of life over time separate into distinctly different forms. Rather, what we see is an evolutionary law where we have only three different phyla of life showing up uh, before the Cambrian explosion you get 19 or more showing up at the Cameron explosion all at the same time, and you only get a few more than six showing up after the Cambrian explosion. Now some of these graphs will have different numbers on it, but these are the minimum numbers that you'll see in the published literature. But what I'm noting here is that right at the base of the Cameron explosion, everything shows up at the same time. Now, that includes our own phylum. We are part of the chordate phylum. Chordates include all those animals that are described by a body plan of a tube inside a tube. So one tube is the rib cage, the other tube is the spinal column. 
That includes all birds and mammals. It includes reptiles. It includes amphibians. They're all part of the chordate phylum. And they show up right at the very base of the chordate phylum. There is no evolution. It shows up immediately once the oxygen level reaches that point. This has been disturbing to evolutionary biologists. Kevin Peterson, for example, wrote this in his book. Although the Cameron explosion is of singular importance to understanding the history of life, it continues to defy explanation. What he means is it defies a naturalistic explanation. It's perfectly consistent with a supernatural explanation. Richard Dawkins has written this. The Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 600 million years ago, are the oldest ones in which we find most of the major invertebrate groups. And we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution their very first time they appeared. It is though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. This is coming from the world's most famous atheist evolutionary biologist. But God's not done. He now introduces, for the second time only, the creation of something brand new out of nothing. And this is referring to the birds that he creates and the sea mammals. And with the birds and the sea mammals, it uses two verbs. It says God made them and he created them. Why two verbs? Well, the text is telling us that God supernaturally created or made the bodies of these animals. It doesn't use the word create because after all, we had bodies of animals previous to the birds and the mammals. You had the reptiles, you had the amphibians, you had the insects. They existed before. That wasn't brand new. What was brand new about these birds and mammals is they're endowed with soulish features. God endows them with mind, will, and emotions so they can care for one another, relate to one another, emotionally bond to one another, but they're also designed to do the same thing with human beings. So this would include all the animals that we contain. It includes all the animals that nurture their young. Every bird and mammal species is a nephesh creature. And there are a few, very few, of the reptilian species that also fall into that category. And each one, according to Job 38 and 39, which goes into this in much more detail, I'll be uh, speaking about this uh, tomorrow, is designed to relate to human beings in a different way. So the horse is designed to relate to us very differently than the donkey. Every one of these nephesh creatures is designed to serve and please us, each in their own distinct way. And I'll speak tomorrow about how that provides a profound challenge uh, to any evolutionary paradigm. Then we move into day six, where it says God created three advanced kinds of land mammals. Now, once again, Michael Shermer tried to ridicule Genesis 1 by saying it puts the land mammals after the sea mammals when the fossil record puts it the other way around. I had to correct him in this sense. Creation day six is not talking about God creating land mammals generically. It doesn't even use the word for uh, soulish animal in the fetch. Rather, it jumps ahead and talks about God creating three specialized kinds of land mammals, those that are most crucial for serving the needs of human beings. And it mentions just these three kinds. First, it talks about the short-legged land mammals, a reference to the rodents which were crucial for launching human civilization. Why? Because these are warm-blooded mammals with small bodies. And in order to keep their body temperature at a safe level, they had to grow thick, luxuriant fur. The first humans readily recognized that these rodents were ideal for clothing. In fact, when I was a young boy growing up here in Canada, they still had a thriving uh, furrier industry here taking advantage of these little cute, uh, thick-furred uh, rodents. And you especially get the high-quality fur when you're raising them in a cool climate. Today, we don't need their fur because we have artificial material. We also got PETA telling us not to do it. Uh, but today, we need these rodents for a very different reason. We have discovered that mice and rats, not the great apes, have the same identical chemical pathways that govern memory. And so it's through research on rats and mice that we're getting cures for human dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, dyslexia, etc. We're actually developing uh, mental steroids 
from research on these creatures. And so what's interesting is that our DNA is identical to mice and rats in terms of brain memory pathways, uh, but our DNA is close to identical with the great apes when it comes to our internal organs. I think God knew ahead of time we would eventually get the medical technology where we could take advantage of the organs of the great apes. And he also knew that we would develop a technology where we could take advantage of these mice and rats to develop cures uh, for the mental uh, dysfunctions that are plaguing us now that we're living as long as we are. So it's something our family thanks God for in Thanksgiving, as all the mice and rats that they created. <laughs> but then he made two different kinds of long-legged land mammals. Uh, those that uh, are difficult to tame, contrasted with those that are easy to tame. Pardon me, I've got to get away around. <laughs> it's the herbivore long-legged land mammals that are easy to tame, whereas the carnivore long-legged mammals are difficult to tame. And God created both. And basically this is brought out in the Book of Job, namely that the herbivores are designed by God predominantly to serve our economic needs. These are the creatures that we use for farming, sheep, goats, cows, horses. And then he gave us the long-legged land animals that are difficult to tame, that are really not that useful for agricultural industry, but are very good as companions for human beings. So it's the carnivores that we predominantly use uh, for social interaction. And the theme here is that God gave us these animals to serve us and to please us. So it's the carnivores that we go for pleasure. It's the herbivores that we go uh, for service, predominantly. Not that there isn't some overlap there. And so God gave us these three creatures. And what we notice is, if you look at Job 38 and 39, the animals that are mentioned there are those animals that are crucial for launching human civilization. And when societies lack those animals, they never got out of the Stone Age. Again, I'll talk about that briefly tomorrow. But last of all, in creation day six, God creates human beings. Here again, we see a sovereign. God made us and he created us. He made us because the soulishness previously existed. The bodies previously existed. What didn't previously exist was the spirit. We're the only species that God has made that is body, soul, and spirit. We're the only species for whom God could say they're created in my image. As God is body, soul, and spirit, so are we body, soul, and spirit. And let me conclude this with something I discovered at age 17. I spent four hours studying the first page of the Bible. And when I noted at the end of that four-hour study, that in terms of Genesis 1, appreciating that the word Yom does indeed mean a long, finite period of time, and that the frame of reference for the six days is the surface of the earth, we note that the Genesis text here in Genesis 1 gets four for four correct on the initial conditions compared to the established record of nature, and 10 for 10 on both the description of the creation events and the order in which they're sequentially placed here in Genesis 1. 14 for 14. The best I found outside of the Bible was the Enuma Elish of the Babylonians, where it got two out of 14 right. The rest of the creation texts outside of the Bible get a score of zero. The Enuma Elish, two out of 14, the Bible gets 14 for 14. So it was a crucial piece of evidence that persuaded me that the Bible indeed is the error-free inspired revelation from the one that created the universe. The more we learn about nature's record, the more reasons we gain to trust the reliability of Genesis 1 and the rest of the Bible. Well, let me conclude with this. If God cared and supernaturally intervened so much in preparing the earth, and all of its life for human beings, then how much more must he care and supernaturally intervene in the life of every human being? I mean, it tells us in Psalm 147 that God knows the name of every single star, and there's 50 billion trillion stars in the universe. You know, there's more than a trillion stars for every human being uh, that has ever lived. God knows the name of every star. Do you think he knows your name? They're far more valuable than a star. They're far more valuable than all the stars. 